Pen, this here's a rubber duck, and I'm about to put the hammer down. Welcome to the Thick Goes Out, the best damn AD and the second edition podcast ever. Welcome to Splat Book 34 of Thick Goes Hammer. Sit down. Uh, Brian wants to see your character sheet. I think there's some pop in the fridge here. And this time, um, there you we're going to be talking about... Um, Oh, sure. And uh, what are we talking about? Um, scrying, divination, things like that. Yes. This show. Or as I put in the show description, you have you have the ultimate answer, but what is the question? That's true. We had a little time before the game. We thought we'd squeeze this in. So without further ado, oh, by the way, I'm Dean Glenn. And of course, that was Dean Brian. That's me. And, and the other player is Dean Full-On Gamer. Say, uh, yes, I am full on gamer today. <laughs> <laughs> or or yeah. or Galatro Heart Cleaver trying to be full on gamer, something like that. Pretty much. <laughs> you've been mess you've been messing with your character sheet again. Okay. Uh anyway, let's get on to hits and crits. What are you doing tonight? I don't know. What are you doing tonight? The burlesque, Lois Paradise, miserable and lonely, miserable and lonely and stupid. What am I, crazy or something? I got something good here. What am I hanging around with you guys for? Hits and crits. Hits and crits. Okay, guys. Um, Brian, what have you been doing? Anything? Um, just, just uh, thinking about the next adventure to throw you guys into once you guys get through Horror on the Hill. Either yeah, that. We're going to post that first one one of these days. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, uh, just for the... Uh, yeah, did we... Are we going to be able to put that on uh, D20 Radio full on, or... I have to talk to them. I have to find out still. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, no, it's no big deal. Um, So what we're going to do is we're going to put up episode zero of that, which was uh, DM Glenn and full on rolling up their characters and coming up with concepts and stuff. And that's not interesting. Why do we need that up there for? Why not? <laughs> you you'd be you'd be surprised what you know what our listeners find interesting that we don't, Glenn. <laughs> I'm surprised at what you find interesting. <laughs> but um yeah, we have the first session recorded and in the can and we'll just be putting it up uh as soon as pretty almost as soon as we fit we put the dice away. So we'll be yeah, you know, next so, week. It'll be ready. Next week it'll be it'll be it'll be a live broadcast of Thaco's Hammer eating lunch at Taco Bell. Okay. So <laughs> and the aftermath now that therein. would be funny. And the aftermath therein. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, that's an after, aftermath I want nothing to do with. What, but anyway. Yeah. What's up, Full on? What have you been doing? Oh, I've been continuing to work on stuff with the various guilds in the old republic. Recording for the Holocron uh, podcast. What is that? That's the Old Republic podcast hosted by D20 Radio and affiliated with the Order of 66. Ah, okay. Which you can find at d20radio.com. Oh, yes. Yes. And beginning to organize the promotion party for next week. Okay, you can give you the kickback later. But oh uh, yeah, that's 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 interesting. <laughs> and more uh more old republic playing. When I'm done with you guys today, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I see where the priorities are. Okay, well I really can't knock that. Me, um actually, um I had a another session with my grandson and his friend. And uh, we are running. They are running into the quest of the silver sword, which is a nice little uh, go to the you know go to the uh, castle and kill the kill the ratlings and the were rats and all them kind of rat things down there. Ooh, not that kind they, of silver sword. Okay. Yeah, no, it's this is a different silver sword. First thing they do when they get there, there's a door wide open. Oh, I sent a couple of NPC characters with them too. Uh, first thing you want to do is, okay, you want to go in the door? No, we want to climb up on the roof, sneak up on them. Oh, okay, well, make a dexterity check. They did. 
you're up on the roof. What do we see? Oh, nice view of the area and uh, a roof. <laughs> well, there's a broken. Hey, vertical broken. envelopment. It works in all That's eras. That's true. So they went. Thatch down. roof, wood roof, slate roof, yeah. wood roof. They've killed some rattlings in a few rooms, and they found a magical bell that'll give them, uh, whoever owns it, a full meal three times a day when he rings it. That cuts That's down so on rations. Pretty oh, yeah. much. Mm -hmm. But uh, so they're they're going through it and they're having a ball. And that's pretty much uh, what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. and that, excellent. That. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Do we have any emails? Yes, we do, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. What do we got? Okay, we have one from a new emailer to the show. His name is Ben McKenzie. Hi, Ben. Uh, okay, he said, hey, I just discovered the podcast last week, and I'm currently yes. going through... Hmm? No, go ahead. Okay. And I'm currently going through all the back episodes. Please for, please forgive me if my questions were discussed were discussed in later episodes. I'm currently on episode three. That's okay. A badge and all hope ye who enter. <laughs> Your soul is mine. Anyway, um, after many years, I'm going to be starting up a game soon, and I'm a bit rusty, but I want to ask a couple of questions and get some opinions on two topics. First... I know that most of you were in favor of maps and miniatures. However, I spent most of my gaming years avoiding them because of a worry of too much complexity. In recent years, I've managed to play in two games that both use miniatures. One kept the combat fast and loose, while the other made combat longer and felt more like a war game, which really dragged down the pacing of the game. One had the hectic feel of combat, while with the other, more time was spent discussing tactics rather than rolling dice and killing the beasties. I'd like to use the 2E miniature rules, but I'm worried about it making combat too slow. I'd like my players to be able to make tactical decisions, but not have to spend 5, ten, five to 10 minutes discussing them just to execute them. How well do the miniatures rules keep combat fast? Uh, it I all hinges on mean. the players and the DM. Yeah. If you have people who think tactically, who, who are planning ahead a few moves and ready to be flexible and adjust what they're going to do, they can go fast and you'll still get that tactical environment. The DM still has to present it as something that's fast paced, hard pitched and demanding immediate responses to try and keep things rolling. And the players have to buy into that as well. If you, on the other hand, you get those people who don't even have a concept of what they're going to do until you turn to them at the table and say, it's your niche. And then they spend another five minutes with their thumb, you know, stroking their jaw going, well, I think I could. Well, yeah, you're going to have problems. But again, it all hinges on the players, their mindset and the DM and his presentation. Mm-hmm. Thank Go you. Ahead. The rules that. are irrespective of it. You can have that in any system. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have said it better myself since I don't use miniature systems anyway. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, maps are kind of a necessary evil, at least until, well, maps aren't necessary until you see something like roll for initiative. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, then the way I do is I got a battle man out there. Okay, let me map the room since you just ran into two whites or something like that. Mm-hmm. And as far as miniatures go, well, yeah, miniatures are fun. Miniatures are nice. i got a set myself, which I still have to paint. But <laughs> I've uh, gotten older, and I've gotten lazier, and now Cardboard Heroes get it for me. <laughs> I've printed those out, cut them up, made bases for them. They work just fine. So you might want to look for those Cardboard Heroes or something like that. The Internet's full of paper mini stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's the e that's the easy way to go about. It. I mean, for me, I'm somewhere in the middle. I mean, my whole thing is is that I just have miniatures out there just just so that everybody just has an idea of what's going on. I mean, right. <laughs> that was our first abortive attempt at a session was trying to get a place where I could put the video up of the map of the battle mat, but that that quite didn't work out so well. Um, I remember that. Yeah. It does work best face to face over a table. Well, but when you there. when you get that you you can it solves so many more issues than it creates as far as saying where people are, where they are related to the threat or the room and it it avoids the person teleporting about randomly <laughs> into the trap, the door, the treasure, the new monster, the old monster and the loot. Yep. I agree. 
And I think you, you shouldn't have to worry too much about uh, combat speed because it's like Fallon said, that's all dependent upon the players. You know, I mean, and also the DM for allowing them to sit there for five to ten minutes, you know, trying right. to figure out strategy. When once the combat starts and initiative goes, you know, or it, or at the very least your actions are you know, are to be determined before initiative is rolled. You have, you give your players 10 seconds, 10, 15 if you want to be generous. 10 seconds is usually good, but 10 seconds to say, okay, what are you going to do? And if they, and if they're just like, uh, or, uh, well, up oh, too late, your character's frozen in place, you have no action this round. And you're still deciding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you don't even have to sit there with a stopwatch trying to clock it like that. I mean, it's just the difference between presenting it as, hello, you've come into the room. There's orcs over there. There's five of them. Which one are you going to attack? And mm-hmm. you burst into the room. There are orcs lined up along the far wall. What do you do? Yeah. Exactly. It, like I, yeah, it's like you said, it all depends. Too okay. slow. They fire their crossbows. Yep, exactly. That's you know, what happens. That, yeah, some people just get get a massive case of indecision, and it pay, and they pay for it. Okay, second question. Yep. Paradoxically, oh, this will be this will be one that you're going to like, Glenn. Paradoxically, I want to use weapon speed so that players' decisions have a greater effect on combat. Right now, the idea is group initiative plus initiative modifiers plus weapon speed. Wow. Um, however, after hearing a brief discussion on how weapon speed factor weapon speed slows down combat, I heart, wholeheartedly disagree. But that's just me. I was hoping if you could get a group discussion on the pros and cons on using weapon speed. I don't like using the damage type rules, okay, well, to each their own, because I think that would slow down combat even more so. But if it would be faster to drop weapon speed and use damage type instead, I would consider doing that. Again, thanks for the great podcast, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, once again, I would... Just lost the thought. That word paradoxically threw me. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but mm-hmm. no, um, once again, um, the weapon speed, yes, it can slow down combat some. I don't use it in basic. And as far as weapon speed in this game goes, I've gotten to the point of, meh. You know, the way Brian's running it and the way he's doing it, there really isn't, it really doesn't, you know, factor in that much. But, mm-hmm. you know, weapon speed plus this, plus that, too many numbers, boy. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, 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 well the good news is he's cutting down the numbers by going with a group initiative and then yes. everybody gets their individual splay out from that based on their individual modifiers and their weapon speeds which works it's a way to do it you yeah. can do it everybody's individual initiative and all their modifiers you can do it a group initiative and all their modifiers and the damage type thing is a different element that really has nothing to do with what what weapon speed you're dealing with. I agree. The, the damage type is these weapons by type are good against this size. Mm-hmm. Okay. This many dice, that many dice, plus minus whatever. That's just mm-hmm. a factor of what you're choosing to do damage with mm-hmm. or See, how much me, damage that's... you want to appeal for mm-hmm. versus these how days... fast we get it out there. Right. These days, the, the weapon type is, is disposable as far as I'm concerned. It can Small, be. medium, large. That that one is it just it, I use it, but I use it when oh. I when we're gaming in these kind of games. But oh. I don't use it in basic, and it's just it's slightly annoying. Oh, let me let me clarify. He meant the piercing, slashing, crushing oh, damage to type. Me that, that has no meaning to me at all. But the only That's t- an absolute yeah. important meaning when you're dealing with skeletons. Yeah, yeah. Or when you're dealing, dealing with a yeah, cool. dealing with a monster, it's immune to one or another one inflicts more damage. I agree. Um, if I have a skeleton in front of me, I know to step back and let the cleric swing his mace. I don't need to s- find out whether it's slashing or bludgeoning or whatever. Well, I'm trying to go into the super extended table of these bludgeoning weapons do this adjustment based by damage type against armor class, you know, benefits yeah. against armor class, that might be getting a bit too much drug out. Right. Because I again, agree. track of everything you're fighting, everything you're fighting with, what they're wearing, what they're not wearing what they're grown and born with, if it's natural armor, what, whatever. It, that adds too much. And and even I, and people who know me, will look goggle-eyed at that and say, okay, 
I agree that that's too much, too far going into the simulationist, wargamist versus the gamer war game, the, the gamer role player. Right. That that's a that's more of a holdover from one E when you had the different modifiers against the different armor class types. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, I got rid of that too. Well, yeah, I had to at some point. It was driving me nuts. Um, but I think. You know, to be, I'm going to be rather frank with you know, our friend Ben here. I think you're worried a little too much about you know keeping the keeping the pace quick. Um, you know, the way you're doing combat is fine. You know, that's a that's a different way of uh, determining you know how people move on their initiative numbers. You know, with by doing the group number, then the initiative modifier. And then your weapon speed on top of that. That's a much different way of doing it. But um, I don't think that it would slow things down too much if, you know, if you went with just your initiative and weapon speed. If you took out the mod the initiative modifiers from that. I mean, I've used that. I've used that ever since I started running Second Edition, and I haven't course, had too many problems. With another it. good thing is if you want to have everybody feel like they're contributing, go with the group initiative, and the initiative modifier is the individual who's rolling the initiative, and then just move that round robin around the table so everybody takes a turn. Wow. And sometimes you go quickly because it's off of the guy with the 18 decks who points out the open objective and people react to it quickly. And other times the guy who has the eight decks is sitting there going, oh, what? And things <laughs> pass you by. <laughs> you lose an opportunity. But it, it, it keeps combat fluid and it doesn't turn it into a we always win initiative. They always lose initiative. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and I'm always I, in this order. Yeah. It, it, it makes things change up and gives you more of that vigorous chaos that is enjoyable in combat versus mm -hmm. turning it into a by rote war game. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, my personal preference is group initiative and then go by decks high to low. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. That, I've, yeah. Group, I've played in games like that. I played in games. Of like course, to, with me, the monsters, it doesn't matter because they all go at once, but uh, <laughs> that's yeah. how I do it. Yep. Anyway, how about you? You and you, Brian. You pretty much do the weapon speed. Mm -hmm. And what about what about initiative? Um, well, you, what do you mean? How we be, how we've been doing initiative? Uh, you roll your d10, you add your weapon speed to it, and that's pretty much it. Um, right, but there's but there is a group. Um, no, it's individual. I mean, but is it group on the other side? Oh yeah, absolutely, side? absolutely. Okay. Um, if there are different groups of monsters, they have different initiatives. You know, I roll yeah. separately for different groups. But yeah, even then I wouldn't. Well, OK, no, yeah, I, I, as long as I you don't get that ridiculous. You can matter. suddenly turn a normal fight into a TPK if all of a sudden the 15 monsters you're controlling all act at once. Then it gets that. Bad. Yeah. 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 Then there's that. I mean, let's let's use uh, our first session as just a small example. Um, all right. You guys ran up against a bunch of Sturges. Now, Sturges are small monsters. You know, they have. um an initiative modifier of like three. So the problem was, is that, well, it wasn't a problem, but the thing that was going on is that the majority of the players have weapons that are a speed factor of four or higher. And so the Sturges were going first more often because of that. But, but when you quick little buggery Sturges, they're supposed to. Yeah, this is true. I'm just I'm just using it as an example. Right. Um, when you start running into like you know ogres and giants and stuff like that, it's not going to matter as much because the chances are you're going to go before they do. Right. You know you have the advantage against larger monsters, but small monsters not so much. Hey, it, it works out on the player side that way too. Look at halflings. Yeah. Well, it's harder to hit. A, it's harder for a big guy to hit a halfling. True. Yeah, they get that bonus. But uh, yeah, but yeah, I'm just saying it, it can it'll work both ways. It it won't be always where you know. You, I mean, I'm going to use your character Glenn as an example because he's wielding right. a batter lax, and right. with the speed factor of seven, you know, yeah, in a fight against small to medium creatures, you're going to go towards the end of the round. You know, more often than not, but which I usually did. Yeah, yeah, but you know, against Sturges, you know, that was going to be expected anyway. Um, but against the larger creatures such as ogres, giants, and the like, you know, it you're going to be going probably just before they do, or or immediately after. 
you know, instead right. of towards the end of the round. I'm just saying. Right. Because mm-hmm. they're very much slower. Yes, they are. Yeah. So. So, uh, well. <laughs> the, I hope I, yeah, I hope we answered your question, Dan. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I couldn't get it out for some reason. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, just and keep those emails coming. We love to debate and answer any questions questions on any fuzzy rules that you may not fully grok, if you will. Yeah. Uh, or mm-hmm. or number. yep. Or you can leave a voicemail on our on our Google Voice, which is 405-806-0555. And there's a myriad of places you can talk to us at. It's first and foremost, d20radio.com where mm-hmm. gamers roll. That's right. <laughs> and, With uh, the rest always, of the Gamer Nation. That's yep. right. Uh, OSRgaming.org. We've yes. got dragonsfoot.org. We've mm-hmm. got, uh, oh, a lot of them. Uh, PlanetADD.com. Thank you. Purpleworm.org. Nutkinland.com. That's a new one. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. there's... We have a there. Facebook page. We have... We have a P- Facebook? We, actually, we're on the Piazza, too. I post we all our the stuff there. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I hear, I hear there's a rumor that we have a Twitter page. That's right. At Thaco's Hammer, easy easy to find. Uh, I post all the I uh, post uh, links for the our new episodes as soon as they come out, and they're That's up there. Great. And there are a bunch of hashtags I put on that so that we can get a bunch of people to at least look at these things. You know, if not. Really? Oh yeah, that's how that's how you do it with social media with with Twitter anyway. You put up a bunch of hashtags and people will see it if they search on it. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, I, 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 I got I got Twitter figured out. <laughs> you got that them fancy social network things. I just don't understand them. <laughs> Actually, there are a couple really good book groups on Facebook. Who, yeah, no, stop that. You're not that old, Glenn. Um. There are a couple of good groups on Facebook that have fully embraced Thaco's Hammer from the moment that I found them and I started posting stuff on there. Oh, um, yeah? What? Yeah, there's a like, second edition AD&D group on Facebook. Um, I think it's called Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition. Uh-huh. Um, and also there's one called Old School Gaming that I put stuff up on. And, and they just love us, right? Oh, yeah, they do. They absolutely do. So we're we're out there, people. You can find us yep. if you look a little bit. We're also on iTunes. Yes. If they're listening, I think they found us. Yeah, this is yes. true. But yes. you know what? Uh, yes. But you know what? what? Tell what? a friend. <laughs> Tell a friend. <laughs> Tell a friend. Get him in. Get him on. Get him to listen to us too, because we can we can use as many listeners as we can get. And of infomercial back to the show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's go on. Let's go on to option package. My personality undergoes a startling change. You know, you should meet me because I'm a great guy. I like big fat men like you. When they fall, they make more noise, and sometimes they never get up. Option package. Option package. Boy, we got a list today. We're going to talk about the diviner, the specialist mage diviner, also known as a water witch, I think, with the, uh, oh, that's a water, water diviner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're funny, Glenn. Um, yeah, the, basically a diviner castle. That's what people say when they see me. Yeah. Uh, really, what do they divine? They, well, In, they have. They're uh, DM's bane. Yeah. Information. Yes. They need information. Information. Who are you? The guys with. You Sorry, you you started. The new number two. Hey, <laughs> Thank I'm you. the new number two, so get over it. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, they want information. The guys, they're the guys with the crystal ball, the uh, tarot cards, mm-hmm. the you know the the pools they look into and scry scrying over you. But anyway, those are the kind of guys that we're talking about here right correct isn't there a kit or something for these guys um no 
I mean, it is it like in the player's handbook. Uh, not only can you be just a generalist mage, which means you can cast every spell, blah blah blah, but you can also specialize in the ma- in the schools of magic, and divination is one of them, or greater divination, yeah. I should say. And the opposite school is conjuration summoning. Is that an oxymoron or what? No, it's just they're just covering their bases. You know how it is. Well, I know, but full on made a good point off off the show here that uh, it really doesn't make any sense, right? Well, either they're in direct competition with each other, but they really should be cooperative because they really do cover all the bases. If you want to get an answer, you either rip the knowledge out of the ether raw and hope it's correct, <laughs> or you summon someone and ask him directly and hope he's honest. Mm-hmm. Ah. Or compel his honesty. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, yeah. I think that Conjuration Summoning just uh, goes, I mean, it uh, deals with, uh, you know, just uh, the dealing with uh, other forces and things like that, you know, and making them do their, their uh, they, oh, here it is. I'll even do that. Conjuration spells are for... Uh, produce various forms of non-living matter, summoning spells entice or compel creatures to come to the caster, as well as allowing the channel, caster channel forces from other planes. Uh, but we're not talking about him. We're talking about the divination. Yeah, the and, and diviners, yeah. all they do Div- is, is for information. Diviners are the one bozo in the party with the ESP spell or the crystal ball that'll mm-hmm. blow the plot wide open. They could, but... Yeah. But it's up to the. This is where the DM earns his stripes. He has yeah. to give information in such a way that it doesn't blow the plot wide open, or be and, prepared for the plot to be blown totally open and deal with it. Yeah. Then yeah, there's that. That's about right. Then there's that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, this to me, when it comes to magic user spells, divination sort of gets short shrift, in my opinion. I mean, those who are veteran gamers who want to have as much information about an adventure or a dungeon or a magic item or whatever, they will use these. They will use uh-huh. a divination spell to, you know, find out what you know what it is about. Oh, this this ruined castle up on the hill and things like that. Right. Before but, you had a bard, this was your legend lore. I agree. Yeah. One hundred percent. And you and you know what. This is the kind of character that if you're a GM who wings it, it really sh- it really stretches your talents. That's what that's what I meant. That's how they earn their stripes. Exactly. You do have to be fast on the draw with your improv, whether it's presenting <laughs> the answers to the augury, revealing the scene that someone's observing through the crystal ball, or, or whatever, exactly. or stacking the deck on the fly so that you can throw down the prophecy you want with the tarot cards, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like, or, yeah, just describing what the character sees when he casts a clairvoyant spell. You know, things like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he, like, like, go he ahead. He sees the other mage staring at him saying, go away. <laughs> Sometimes it's safer to go with the clairaudience than the clairvoyance because, you know, the mage casts clairvoyance and begins to observe and he freezes into a statue. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, there's That's a clue. That. For the rest of the party. Yeah, there is that. Um, is, but yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go, go is, ahead. Isn't there, is there downsides to some of these divination spells? Like, I've known in some spells where you whip something on somebody for divination, they will know you're doing that. Yeah, I think that's contact. No, not contact other plane. Um, oh, goodness. I think there's a drawback with the augury spell, but we're going to talk about that in, in probably our next segment. Okay, okay um, we'll leave it for them then. Okay, um, but getting back to the diviner, eh, diviner as uh, a class, um, they get a minus one. Uh, their opponents get minus one penalty when trying to save against divination spells cast by him. Uh, uh-huh. They get a bon- The diviner himself gets a plus one bonus when saving against divination spells or magical devices, such as someone using a crystal ball on on a diviner there's a better chance it won't work ah uh, mhm mhm you got to have a wisdom of 16 if you want to be a specialist wizard of divination yes 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 and let's see only humans elves and half elves can be diviners <laughs> which is good 
You know, I mean, that only makes sense because, you know. Why do you think they went to Galadriel? Yep, this is true. Yeah, Galadriel and, God, and oh, God, who? Um, sorry, I I just need to ask, answer. Celeborn. Huh? Celeborn? No, 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 no. I was going to ask the actress who played her in the movie, and I can't remember her name or off the hand. Off Kate, the hand. Kate, Kate, Kate Blanchett. Blanchett. Yes. She, how, she did She did a great job playing her. But um, Yeah, she wasn't that hot. Anyway. Well, that's um, true. But, you know. Um, in the Complete Wizards Handbook, which takes the specialist mages and gives them just a just a little bit more oomph even though they have to be like you know they get up around 17th level before it starts kicking in um if a diviner reaches 17th level he becomes immune to all forms of scrying spells and magic items that duplicate those effects um at 19th level they have uh an ability to cast a special fine trap spell three times a day uh-huh. Which is actually pretty nice. Although I would give that to them at a lower level, like tenth or something like that, because uh-huh. it's just, you know, it, for what it is, it's it's just sort of like, oh yeah, so what? I'm nineteenth level. I don't need to worry about that. Um, right. Then when they if they reach twentieth level, they get uh, a special divination spell. Um, they, all they have to do is cast a uh, oh, concentrate for like a full turn a full turn 10 minutes and uh-huh. it reveals a useful piece of advice about a goal event or activity that's going to occur within seven days um okay. you know it's nice. just it's yeah it's nice little abilities and here's the part that i always enjoy and my players always hate the revelation may take the form of an omen a short phrase or a cryptic mm-hmm. verse yes but will always reveal specific advice i'm big on improving rhymes limericks poems all kinds of what's it's to come back uh, with my auguries and my omens and divinations and my players mm-hmm. sometimes kind of hate me for that well you're making them think <laughs> and i Sometimes I'm entirely honest in what I say, and of course, when the spell fails, I'm sometimes entirely false in what I say. And yep, <laughs> yep, yep. There's no tells in that, so you can't get the difference, mm-hmm. which is the point. Uh, right. Anyway, anyway, if you want to talk about uh, divination, you could uh, drop us a line at thecoshammergmail.com or on the other boards. Let's move on to it's in the book. You ever go to school, stupid? Yeah, and I come out the same way. Is that your idea of an idea? It's in the book. It's in the book. Crystal balls. I got you, Crystal. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Easy. Crystal. <laughs> a crystal ball you will find in the DMG page 164, and full on will tell you where you can find it in the Encyclopedia Magica. Encyclopedia Magica, Volume 1, page 344 through 347. Mm-hmm. Wow. Cause, cause it's, really... got, it's got different versions. I was going to say, there's probably other places. Well, actually, too. all the way through 348, because they also have Morelden's Crystal Ball and the Eye of the Gods, <laughs> your Crystal Ball of Crystal I... Hypnosis. Yep. Eye of Vecna. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal Ball avec Clairaudience. I don't know why they have it in French. Yeah, that is kind of weird. Yeah, the eye uh, of the this gods. Is, this is kind of this is kind of the uh, stock and trade of this kind of mage. Yes, I agree. You know, this is like a basic tool for them. I I remember when I first started playing. Uh, when I was playing basic back in the day, this when you had a mage character. This was like one of the magic items that all the players wanted. You know, and when they got it, they could never figure out how to use it. <laughs> yeah, they would always screw it up. It's true. But yeah, um, yeah, the crystal ball. Um, I'll use. I'll just go from the dis- description I have here. Uh, it's a crystal sphere about six in- six inches in diameter. A wizard can use this device to see ver- over virtually any distance or into other planes of existence. That's what makes it so powerful. Right. Uh, um, you. But the th- the drawback is is that if you're using it to view a subject, you have to know the subject. You know, be a personal acquaintance, may even have something of its uh, like a something from his belongings or something like that. But there is a uh, a percentage chance of 
depending on how well you know the subject you're trying to scry, there's a percentage chance that's uh, that goes along with that. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And some of them have additional powers, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Their audience, maybe, or one with DSP, or one with telepathy. Yep. And if you're really, really hooked on your social media device here, <laughs> and you just can't put it down, you can fry your brain. Because there's saving throws involved when forcing the crystal ball to be used more often than is uh, advised for your yep. level of knowledge of a subject. Mm-hmm. And if you fail, you can permanently lower your intelligence by a point. Yep. And it drives you insane until healed. Yep. Which is a bad Ain't thing. Ain't that fun. Ain't that fun. Oh, Which yeah. Which makes you want to use the crystal ball more. Because yeah. you're crazy. <laughs> isn't, isn't this crazy? <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, um... It, and like I said, you can use this to, you know, just, you know, study things. I mean, like, um, oh, God, the Palantir? Is that is that what yes, it was? The Palantir. Yes, the Palantir, Palantir the yes. Yeah, that, that was, a, that was a, a crystal ball with some additional there powers on top of it. Yep. That would be a crystal ball with all of those, clear audience, ESP, and telepathy. Mm, I agree. I agree. One way only. Mm-hmm. Sauron to you. <laughs> Yes, when you look into the abyss, the abyss gazes back at you. But anyway, and, creatures and says, yeah, of twelve please. or better have a chance of noticing they're subject to scrying. Yes, and and see that's the other thing, and that's that's a rule that not too many DMs either know about or use. Is that yeah, there is a chance when someone is scrying you, there is a chance you can sort of where you kind of break the fourth wall and say, "Have you ever had the feeling that you're being watched?" Uh huh. <laughs> Sorry, I had to quote Bugs well, Bunny you know, there. That's okay. <laughs> well, you know, there's also other things besides a crystal ball that can take the place of a crystal ball and work the same way, like, like for druids, pools in a in a clearing mm-hmm. that you can get, like what, what Galadriel did in the movie, you know? Yeah, exactly. Braziers and sensors and pools yes. and all kinds of things fall into this. Mirrors. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, mirrors, things like that. Exactly. The ha- the hammer of divination. Yes. <laughs> The hammer it got, it got mage with a hammer of divination hits himself in the head hard enough. Ooh, wait a minute. <laughs> yes. Of course, there's always the big argument with the DM about what spells can be affected and cast through the through the crystal ball at your subject that you're observing. There's the standard things like comprehend language, read magic, infravision, and tongues. Mm-hmm. That's true. And then there are others that you you've seen it in literature, things like when. You know, the uh, the lich in charge of the in charge of the Red Wizards of Thay when he mm-hmm. busts loose with fireballs through his crystal ball on people <laughs> because he's been angered, mm-hmm. or the Drow, you know, down in Menzel Baranzen, you know, the the High Tower of Sorcerer when they decide to cut loose on things, odd things happen out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. What about what about? Here's an idea. I don't know if this is feasible. Okay. Uh, evil evil wizard has crystal ball. Okay. Say he's a demonologist or whatever. Summons summons a couple of badass demons that he wants to go after the player characters. He mm-hmm. scries, finds them, and points to the crystal ball. Say, go get them, and they go through the crystal ball and attack them. Obviously, because they have tele they're planar creatures with teleport without error, and if they've seen the place, they automatically, aside from being able to teleport without error, just regular teleport. I can see the location. I've perfectly viewed it. I've studied yep. it. I can go there. Yep. So, so basically, they can just like send things through the crystal ball, like summon. I feel like I'm playing Magic: The Gathering now. Okay, summon. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Send a couple of imps or efreets through there or something. Hmm. Reach back into your bag of tricks. I choose you. <laughs> oh God! Now yep. we're getting. Now, we're, yeah, exactly. Um, I could. You know, you want to know what? It, if um, you could do. If you can, either create. See, this is where magic guide and creation. Something we talked about in Splatbook Thirty Two, I think. Um, this is where this comes in because a mage can not only create a crystal ball, but also maybe if he's got if he's got enough mojo, he can actually make something where he can send things through the ball into where you know where he wants to. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I could I could certainly see that. 
I can certainly see that being done. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Crystal balls. Got to love them, folks. DaglasHammerGmail.com. Rule zero now. One would think you've been doing this all your life. We'll remember you said that. I know. I'm sure you hate me just enough. Rule zero. Rule zero. Okay, full on. You're going to have to help me out on this. Magical means of mining matters most aren't not meant to know. Alliteration, anyone? Anyway. Um, That's a tongue twister, isn't it? What are we <laughs> oh, talking yeah. about here? What are we talking about here? <laughs> well, we're talking about the full gamut of things that just between the priests and the mages and the artifacts and the items, there are so many ways that are out there for people to ask questions, get answers, mm -hmm. things that the DM didn't want known, <laughs> things that the DM <laughs> wanted to drop into the game as hints and clues. I mean, the Taroka deck from Ravenloft, that's an augury. It's a fortune telling. It's things that set up the game versus things that drag down the game. How are you going to handle it? Uh and it's idiot brother, the deck of many things. <laughs> uh huh. Hey, uh -huh. the crystal ball four from the Dragon Quest game listed in your Encyclopedia Magica is no. basically a deck of it's it's a six shot deck of many things. You get yeah. three stats that go up and three stats that go down just because you tried to look at it and you take damage if you try to rip it off the stand. Next. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Yep, yep. Okay. Um, I was like I said, Taroka deck, deck of many things. Uh, oracles. Yep. Whether alive or not. Prophecy. Uh, yep. Prophecies, the yep. old man. Hey, I'd march. Shut up, uh, shut up old man. <laughs> um, then you will see. Always in motion is the future. That's right. Yep. Um, uh, gypsies with their, you know, the way they can read your palm or, you know, that kind of thing. That's what you're mm -hmm. talking about, right? Right. Okay. Um, that has some potential to screw up your game. If yeah. You're not on the, if you're not on the ball. Yep. Like so I how said. do you get on? So how do you get on the ball? What kind of things would you predict? Well, not just to, 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 you know, prepare for. Oh, well, in it, well, the whole thing is, is that when, uh, a PC is trying to use magic to find, to gain information that could possibly, you know, really screw with the DM's plans. It's you know, this is when the DM has to has to be cryptic as hell. You know, unless the character casting a spell is like um, uh, is going to commune directly with his god. And even then, the D see the thing is, this is where the DM has the control of of what kind what kind of information that you know that he gives out. Just but you have to also remember, it's not just control. You have an obligation. If they have the ability, if they have the power, if they have the device, and the chance they roll means a success, you have to give them legitimate information. Right. But you, don't you can't have... just screw with them. Yeah, but you can't hand it on, hand it to them on a silver platter either. That's where that riddles come in. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, when I'm looking at our uh, what we're going to be talking about in the next segment, and it's a perfect example. I mean, but when it comes to, uh, I mean, the more powerful the spell, you know, of course you have to give them the inf you know, the information they're looking for if they're successful at it. I mean, personally. I, you know, I think that a cleric, unless it was like a matter of, you know, massive amounts of life or death, that he should commune with his god and ask him a question about X. You know, if he asks him about, oh, where is where is this legendary sword so I can take it and blah blah blah, the deity's going to be a little annoyed with him to to be to be uh, nice about it. Now, if right. it's something that is hinges upon like a cataclysm that the you know the the player you know the player the cleric's player is trying really hard to circumvent or to prevent, then then the deity would be more inclined to help or you know help or to give information to lead him to what he needs to do or needs to have in order to avo avoid it. It's all or about the situation to me. Or at the very least, not cripple you or curse you for asking such stupid questions. Yeah, exactly. You're asking. Yeah, but, you know, 
I figure you ask Odin. If you're asking Odin about anything except Ragnarok, he's going to be mad. Mm, possibly. I mean, with see with Odin, I have a whole, I have a different take on him. But at least with me, if you have you're having to, com- you can commune directly with your deity, which you know a character has to be really high in level to do. I'd have to look it up. But oh, and here, here's the thing. The other thing to keep in mind. Okay, exactly. commune. Yes, high level, super powerful, and you're guaranteed some kind of an answer. Good, bad, indifferent. Mm-hmm. But how soon can you start having to deal with this? Once they get access to a second level spell. Yeah, but even the, yeah, even with that, that's more just giving just giving a really really strong hint about something rather than getting a direct answer about it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, at least okay. that's how I see it. You know, you well, may like disagree said... full on. Oh, um, I'm, I'm I'm on both sides of the camp because I've had to deal with it as a player and as a DM, and mm-hmm. I've had to deal with it from the, you know, this is a successful reading. I'm giving you your answer, or this is a bogus reading, and I'm going to screw with you. Mm-hmm. Hope you figure it out in uh-huh. time. And bye. <laughs> oh, and also when it comes to when it comes to it being a a chance, you know, to have. Um, to get a correct answer or an incorrect answer or a misleading answer, the DM should roll the dice for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, the player should not roll dice for it. It should, all the player should know is what the chance of it is and tell the DM, DM rolls it and be like, okay, you know, depending on what the the result is, whether it's an honest answer, uh, an ambiguous answer or a dishonest answer. Now, here's some advice for your DMs out there. When you're going to do this, if you don't have the chops to throw down a limerick on the fly or throw out a verse in prose, Mm -hmm. there are other things you can do. Mm -hmm. Uh You can take existing song lyrics, rewrite them and twist them like a filk, and do your own thing with them. Like, (laughs) for example, here is an augury that was cast in a game. Is the prince still available to be our ally? The response was, Yea, though he waddles in the puddle of death, he shall fear no other evil, for thou art with him. That was my answer. Wow. That works. That definitely works. And that's that's a perfect example of how to do it as a DM. That's a perfect yeah. example. Um, are, the forces good, out, I... are the forces of the city outside waiting for us? Because they went and holed up somewhere and sealed and warded and protected everything. If you dare to break your seal, you will find more woe than weal. Eyes within and eyes without. Wait for time to draw you out. <laughs> and that's a, that's I, a perfect answer. Yeah. Am I going to die in this battle? All we are is dust in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> Signs say yes. <laughs> Signs say yes. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Da, 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 da. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a, that's exactly how a DM should handle it. It's only when they start getting up high level in ability to cast the higher level divination spells or to have the more or to be able to use the more powerful magic items should they get direct answers. You know, right. that's that's, uh, that's even that's then a great try, to, try to get as creative as you can with how you deliver those answers. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Whether it's dreams, whether it's voices out of nowhere, whether it's chiming bells, oh. sorry, whether it's you know, you know, the stones grind an answer out, uh, mm-hmm. face Little appears bird. on the wall, tongues, words, whatever, mm-hmm. and a burning bush. With it. <laughs> I have these fifteen crash, ten commandments. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, as far as that goes, I mean, all you have to do is look in. Like um, Legends and Lore and the Forgotten Realms uh, deity books where the gods, they even, they tell you as a DM how they send their, their, um, their signs and their portents you know, yeah. and things like that. And, and if a player who should know, should know these things, he sees a sign or a portent, he should act accordingly, you know. And that goes up to and including what agents they might hire to deliver such messages, like divas Mm -hmm. or imps. Yeah, depending on who you're dealing with. Yeah, depending exactly. I I had I had a I had a spiders weaving things into webs. Oh, sure. I had a friend. 
friend who who had a cleric character uh -huh. that he prayed five days for this one ability, this one spell, and the deity got so annoyed at him. He set a diva down with the spell on a scroll, basically looked through his window and just took it just took the scroll and just beamed him on the back of the head and left. <laughs> it, yeah, I here's your that. damn spell now. Yeah, here's your here's your spell now. Leave him alone. He's annoyed with you. I mean, yeah, yeah it's one of these Enough things. Enough already. See, that's the that's the risk you run if you decide to annoy to pester your god with this relatively minor bit of information now if it's something that deals this is, a, this, is a rare, this is a rare quality where i i dive into well-known python mm -hmm. oh don't trouble one thing i can't stand is people groveling exactly. <laughs> sorry brian it's usually it's, usually it's okay than... it's okay it's... i can handle it I follow can... the shoe yes yeah that too but yeah. again the other things that are important with this is as a dm there are ways that you can try to use a little divination yourself about when this is going to show up. Mm -hmm. There are things that you can write into your adventure that are scenario-driven prophecy divination encounters. So those are the easy ones to deal with. You know they're coming. You've pre-written them. You know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Plus, minus, good, bad, indifferent that way. Right. The other thing you got to watch out for are when the players have the ability to start casting the spells on their own, where are they going to be frustrated enough or cautious enough to want to ask? When have you put mysteries before them? When have you put them looking at the unknown saying, man, I, I, I don't know which way to go. I don't know. Should we prep more? Should we charge in? Someone's going to ask something along those lines mm -hmm. and start putting it, start putting basic answers together mm -hmm. ahead of time. If someone's right. going to use divination to find out, where something is in the woods. If someone's going to use divination to try and figure out who is the bad guy, right. is there support? Is there, um, are we going to find, what way do we have to go to find this hidden thing? It's always fun trying to search or, and there's the ways to bend the rules too. A particular artifact item person or place could be barred from scrying, yep. but that won't stop you from scrying something else nearby. True. True. Or being able to detect, I'm looking through the clairvoyant eyes of this fox I possess the mind of, and there's this spot of trees that aren't there whenever he looks at it. Mm -hmm. Now I know where to go, you know? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. I mean, I was just... Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 I didn't have a thought. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I was... Um, reading this book of older fantasy books, uh, the Garthy Overman cycle, or the Lords of Deuce, I should say. And towards the end, uh, the main character is heading back to this one city to destroy this cult who has killed his wife and killed a friend of his. And he has in his possession an artifact level sword which blocks any attempts at scrying. Now, no. The, yeah, no, and the heart, the high, the high priest of the uh, cult that has killed his wife and friend. Um, uh, he's scrying them. He's trying to scry them, but the power of the sword blocks this, the ability to scry. So what does he do? He scries the mount that he's looking at. He's not trying to scry, scribe the hero directly. He's trying to, he, yeah, basically he finds that he even, it even it's funny because it's like almost through the eyes of his mount that he's looking through because all you do is see like two paws, you know, walking along this path or whatever. You know, it's a way to get around that. But yeah. Oi. What? Oi, What's oi, wrong? Oi. What's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. okay. Oh, I sent, I sent you something. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> Quoting Metallica. Very nice. I did the whole song as a response to somebody's divination. Wow. Now see, that's that's see, very well this done. This is the kind of this is the kind of stuff you missed. Aren't you glad? <laughs> now, aren't you glad that you know now? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So because knowing anyway. is half the battle. G.I. Joe. Joe. <laughs> oh, stop it! Stop it! <laughs>
divination and, and such spells, what do you do with them? Yeah. Fakosamergmail.com and all the other places. Throw the number up there again. 405-806-0555. Okay, let us move on to Magic Fingers. Eeny, meeny, chili beanie, the spirits are about to speak. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. Magic Fingers. Magic Fingers. Augury. Mm -hmm. What a name. Yep. What a name. It's a wizard spell of... what well, I'm trying to look it up here. It doesn't seem to... Second level divination right. spell. Mm -hmm. found, I know found in the In wizard's... the priest spell compendium. Yeah, it's in the priest spell. Oh, oh it's first a priest level, spell. First level of it's a Shukinja augury. Yeah, but that's I'm a sorry. It's a, it's a it's a I get the wizard's handbook. I'm thumbing through it here. And where is the, where is the, <laughs> you can well, also find like it in the player's spell. handbook. Yeah, and the uh, priest's handbook, of course, and the uh, priest spell compendium. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Which Augury does. Augury does what? As if I didn't know. Okay. It's it, you're basically trying to find out whether an action you take in the immediate future within ha one half hour or three turns will benefit or harm the party. Um, it's very easy. It's a very easy thing to do. It starts as a base 70% chance of receiving a meaningful reply and plus 1% of the priest casting the spell. Right. Um, they even, uh, excuse me. Plus one percent per level. That's correct. Yeah, so, so as a first level caster, you'd be seventy one percent, seventy two right. at second level, and since it's a second level spell, you'd be seventy three casting it at third level. Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. So, and they give an example. Um, if the question is, will we do well if we venture to the third level, and there's a terrible troll guarding ten thousand silver pieces and a shield plus one, lurking near the entrance to that level, um which the DM you know, estimates the, hard, the party could beat after a hard fight, the augury uh -huh. might be great risk brings great reward. And if the troll's too strong for them, the augury might be woe and destruction await. So, uh -huh. so you know, but that's if it's cast correctly. Now, of course, if they fail that, ro that percental roll, which the DM should determine by uh -huh. all means necessary, um... You know, it's something you know, opposite or misleading about it. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's a very simple spell. It's a good way for the players, if they are they got anything on the ball, to find out whether or not they're about to do something that, you know, could could lead, you know, lead to disaster, basically. TPK! There's a <laughs> yeah, TPK avoidance spell right there, exactly. There, there's, there's the crystal ball. But if you want a more vague and nebulous answer, go for the augury spell. <laughs> exactly. But hey, that, hey, great risk brings great reward. That's, that's pretty straightforward to me. That's yeah. like being an adventurer. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Clang, clang, clang. Is this thing working? Come, 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 come. <laughs> <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> okay. Hands up. Who's used augury in a game? I have. Awesome. Have you? Always. Yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. always have to put up with it. It's too utilitarian a spell for the, you know, cleric to not have, especially if you're going into a setup where you've decided to give, you know, spontaneous casting for healing spells to a cleric so they actually do stock up on yeah. utilitarian spells. Mm -hmm. If he's got access to it, he's going to take it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. If you've got divin see it, see that's the thing. Even if you have minor access to divination this one spell can make can pretty much make or break how things turn out for your party you know right. i mean now if you get the information and you decide to ignore it now that's on the players let the dice fall where they may but this is one of those things where the you know it's a good way for the players to find out whether or not you know they're about you know where they're about to get their get their butts kicked you know, or if they're able to find something that they're looking for or or whatever it might be. 
And the levels that these spells come at can get you access to some pretty interesting role-playing situations. Mm -hmm. Aside from who or whatever is delivering the augury, or the divination, or the whatever it is that they're doing. I mean, just speak with dead. Third level spell. Yep. It lets you have a conversation with something that's been lying around Dusty that you were about to loot. Yep. (laughs) Exactly. Perfect example of it in play. Have you ever seen the movie Fire and Ice? Oh, no. Never have, I don't think. But go ahead. There's a scene where the barbarian, you know, Conan-looking guy walks into a into a witch's lair where the witch died and apparently she had a contingency spell with speak with dead cast on herself ah. and as this guy shuffles through the ruins of her burned out home he kicks her foot and this basically female lich looking thing sits up and goes why do the living disturb the sleep of the dead <laughs> wait a minute wait a minute I know this one I know this one wait a minute <laughs> Sorry. Now, nine out of ten parties are going to jump on the dead thing and beat it down with sticks. One of ten is going to have a conversation and get some useful information. As they should. Yeah, not everything put out there in the world is for the party to kill. <laughs> and that's just how. And that's just. The or at least not it. kill yet. <laughs> not kill yet. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Well, it's good. I'm glad. It's good. I'm glad Chris being on this show. Otherwise, we get Skeletor. Yep, about Skeletor. Now. Yeah. No, we'd have no, we'd have dueling Skeletors right now. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> anyway, but yeah. Aug- why do I need sorceress? I can cast that spell. Yes. <laughs> I would get you yet, he man. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> you Augury, use it, love it, Hate put it. it in your arsenal. My be, God. Most importantly, be prepared for it. Yes. Yes. You talk about it at osrgaming.org and all the other places. Mm-hmm. And now we move on to Brian's favorite, DM's Rag. You're funny. Well, that's quite a story. I think it would be fun to run a newspaper. And here it comes, right over the old plate. The DM's Rag. DM's Rag by the funny guy. Anyway, yeah. uh, we're going to talk about... Du- oh, Brian picked this one this time. Dungeon yeah. number 70. And I'm a, I'm- of... Yeah, I'm regretting my choice. <laughs> the more this goes on, the more I'm regretting it. But okay, we can again. Do it. Pretty much the same the concept ghouls. that the party will have, won't it? True. <laughs> Take it away, Brian. Okay, this King, is. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Kingdom of the Ghouls. There we yes. go. Yeah. Written written by Wolfgang Bauer, who uh, yeah, he's one of the better. He's one of the better writers for second edition i think this is before he came on full full time with tsr um this is in uh dungeon magazine number 70 and uh, (laughs) this is kind of funny this is how this is how involved this guy is he actually said this could be if you're running an underdark campaign this adventure could be linked to shards of the day which is one of the adventures we previously reviewed yeah. Um, another one called Swing Shot, and one called U- Uzaglu of the Underdark. Uh huh. All right. Now, to you know, to for disclosure's sake, this is set in Greyhawk, but you can put this anywhere. If, if and what le- and what levels are they? Five to eight characters of levels nine to fifteen. Keep in mind those numbers: five to eight characters, not your old ventures should be designed for four players. Yeah, whatever. Because you only have to have four to be balanced. No, you need people who are willing to die. <laughs> That's what you have henchmen and retainers for. Yeah, that or... or Sorry the S- to be... Or the if you're talking S- seven and ninth level characters, some of those five to nine characters have henchmen and retainers, so they're included in your body count. Ah. Yeah, well, if they're smart, they won't bring them down here, because this is, this is a really, really tough adventure. Um... Basically, what happens is, is that there is a, uh, it's basically some mages screwed around with the negative material plane with an artifact called the Order of Orb of Shadows. They cre- Yeah, yeah. <sighs> damn, those damn mages, they always mess things up. Um, yeah, they created a portal to the negative material plane. They tried to channel the powder, power of it. Powder, that's good. But channel the power of it for their own benefit. 
and get um, legions of servants, blah, blah, blah. You know, the usual evil mage, you know, I must have more power um, kind of thing. But nothing, you know, but even though they tried to, they tried to prepare for every contingency, it didn't, it just didn't work out well for them. A well, that's what happens if you're going to be sitting there doing negative plane power. I agree. <laughs> Do a little bit of negative plane powder. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> Damn. Oh man! Oh, oh man. man! Yeah, we just yeah we just created a, a new uh, nickname for cocaine. Yes, sir. yes, folks. But anyway, negative plain powder. Yes. Yes. Um. Okay. What ended up happening was a true ghoul came through the portal, attacked uh, attacked his summoners, paralyzed them all, and ate them. <laughs> and well, yeah. Uh, yeah, and he transformed. Then, then went to McDonald's. Yeah. Okay. Transformed the wizard into ghouls like himself. And then they started making did, a kingdom. Did he transform them? Yeah, he transformed he them. He ate of them, or he ate them? No, he ate one of them actually before they you know, as the others watched through paralyzed eyes. <laughs> yeah, well, he had to have a snack to keep going. So. Oh, of course, of course. But um, and they and through the through that they created what was called the white kingdom which was a kingdom of ghouls which became an underground cancer of wow that's one hell of a, a term uh driving all of the other underground races uh before them in panic See, this would go perfectly with last episode's issue with the illithids this would be one of the things that they would have issues with yes exactly that's right that's right exactly I mean, they, they, yeah, they went, they did pretty good. They destroyed us a, a drought enclave. Um, you know, they, uh, let's see. Wow. Then they you ever watched a Resident Evil movie or The Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. That is this module. Oh my God. The Underdark. Is go. It ever. <laughs> go. <laughs> exactly. So. Yeah, they've been. It's just, it's just like we're. Yeah, it's like you were saying, Fawn. Like we were talking about last episode about how we were different factions in the Underdark warring against each other. This is what this turns into. I mean, you have like a Lithids going at it with them, uh, you know, and the you know, Cloakers and Mind Flayer. I mean, Mind Flayers and uh, Drow and this and that and the other thing, Durgar, Troglodytes. I mean, it is just all over the place. Which the gives you opportunity there. for all kinds of interesting alliances. <laughs> interesting, yes. yeah. Yeah. Just don't have a paladin in the party, that's all I'm gonna say. Um, okay. Hey, greater evil first, greater evil first. Hmm. More can be discussed later. See? It all depends on the paladin and the god he worships. Yeah. But anyway, when the, when the PCs get involved in this, now the ghoul, now the the true ghouls are starting to raid onto the surface, and just people are hearing about it, and they're just you know monsters raiding strongholds and this that and the other thing, and that's how the PCs get drug into it. Um, so of course, uh, kicking and screaming, shoot him in the head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These aren't ghouls. They're too strong. You're trying to kill us. And, <laughs> but anyway, um, you first get you first encounter a community of of uh, Smurf Nevlin. They got driven out of the Underdark by these ghouls. So this is where you gain your information, and then, uh, then you're then you're uh, you talk to them, and they tell you, you know, what's going on. And that's when you start going down into the Underdark and trying to get a gain, gain allies to take to end this menace once and for all. Now, true ghouls are literally, actually, yeah, literally twice as strong as regular ghouls. A really? much a much lower armor class. We're talking AC of three, uh-huh. four plus four hit dice. The, they do one to six, one to six, one to eight, and their par- their paralyzation lasts two d six plus six rounds, and you can be infected with grave rot. Do they affect elves? Do they affect elves? Let me find out. Because that's uh, always the big the big stickler is all the party members are affected by the ghoul except the elf. 
Well, you, uh, the so far, uh, the grave rot. It, you know, I think these would affect elves as well. I think so because it does not say. And you know what? I'd probably make it like that. <laughs> just, 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 just to see the elf player's face when he's like, "Oh, I can handle these things. They can't harm me." Gah! Yeah. <laughs> Famous last words, son. Famous last words. Well, the uh, first clue to that should be the, you know, drow ghouls jumping up on somebody's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the grave rot is save versus poison or lose one to six hit points per day until either you make a con check or the disease is cured. Uh, the con check is at a minus four also. Paladins, of course, are immune to that. And what happens if you just run out? You, die, you become of- one. <laughs> he, true ghoul or regular a true, ghoul? Yes, a true ghoul. Yes. So, so, oh, also your standard, your standard night of the day of the living dead infection series. Got yes, it. exactly. Right. Also, they drain strength as a shadow. They can they if there's a if there's a uh, true ghoul priest, they can animate dead once a week with no limit to how many dead they can control. I mean, it's just it just gets worse and worse and worse. You have true ghoul nobles, eight plus three hit dice. Um, anyone who's slain by one of them immediately becomes a full strength specter. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So this. I thought that it became a true ghoul. Yeah. No, if you're slain so by. So you're true saying ghoul. the kingdom of ghouls has agents of specter. Oh. Ouch. Oh, oh, that one hurt. With that my was... little zombie cat. Yeah, no. If you're tra- if, if you're killed by a true ghoul noble, yeah, you become a specter. Uh, wow. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you are. So this is a very very dangerous adventure. Um, but as you know, getting back to the actual story, um, when you meet with the meet with the deep gnomes, they give you actually some nice items like a suit of plate mail plus one, uh, a footman's mace which is a drow adamantine mace, which will, of course will corrode if it's left out in, uh, out in the sun in like two to seven days and a helm of paralyzation resistance. <laughs> so at least you have Ooh, something, some fighting chance, a yeah. fighting chance. Exactly. Did we make it out of an elf's head and a ranger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a little late for that ranger, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so now you have to go down into the Underdark, and the only way you're going to destroy these ghouls is to create an army. That means going to the various denizens of the Underdark and say, look, we have a major problem, you have a major problem, let's band together for as long as it takes to end this problem. Like the Wandering Wood, remember? Yeah, exactly. You know, just a lot more, a lot more deadly. <laughs> and a lot more factions. Mm-hmm. Um, as it comes out, uh, what come, what ends up turning out is that you while you ascend, assemble this army to take care of the ghouls, but you, the PCs, have to go and find the Orb of Shadows and destroy it. That's the only way to end it permanently. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, first yeah. I need a willing legion of fools and gullible food sources to go that way and make a lot of noise over there. Way, <laughs> way over there. <laughs> yep, yep. Pay no attention to the rest of us trying to sneak in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, they even have a table in here about what your chances are, you know, uh, to defeat the ghouls, depending on the number of hit dice of the army you assemble. And there are a lot of things. You have a a bunch of uh, deep gnomes you have um drow you have other things and the more you're able to assemble the better your chances i'd even throw in some regular dwarves because this probably would spill over into the dwarven halls Mm -hmm. i would agree so the dwarven you'd have the full pad of your regular dwarves your duragar your darrow the clans the clans would get together and send a whole bunch of them too Mhm. Mhm. So I mean, yeah. So this is this is a campaign. This is basically a campaigning adventure, as well as the journey to the deepest rest, recesses of the Underdark to find, now, now you know, to find ask, the source. Go ahead. Let me ask: 
Now, staging this, um, are you staging battles a la Siege of Craddy's Freehold? How, what do you mean? Well, I mean, well, you know, day one, day two, the army, the, the movement of the army does this, and you roll a die and find out if, you know, the basic, like, battle system type stuff. Or do you give some kind of feedback to the party as they go off on their heroic adventure special ops mission to go seek the orb? <laughs> Are they getting, like, daily reports of, and today the Legion moved here, and mm -hmm. battle was great and glorious? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you do like Chester me, Grandma. only a... died a little bit. He's still here. He's holding on. He's only bit once. Or, or as, as if, if it was me grabbing the rule cyclopedia, going to the war machine rules. Mm. Well, the the chart I think handles that. I think the yeah. army battle is a background thing. I mean, okay. if you wanted okay. to, if you really wanted to, you could you could do it battle system wise. Stay but man, that battle would take a long ass time. And what um, do you do if the party decides to split up and they just don't think the army can hang or stick together or remain allied unless someone is there, player character wise, pulling the strings and trying to keep it together and keep the fight going while the rest of the people go and do the Frodo dance across the Legion of Doom? <laughs> that actually pro that would work actually pretty well. Um, but as I'm going through this adventure, I'm seeing what the players have all to deal fighting, with. Yeah, I can see that. All fighting all around, and all of a sudden, Underground Lake, the Legion of Doom headquarters rises. Hawk and animal <laughs> walk out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my Legion of Doom. But anyway, getting on with it. No, um, Aquaman, you can't come. You still suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I can fight the Sahugan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Ghoul Sahugan, the Lacedons, the true Lacedons. Yeah. Anyway. But yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at all this. I mean, you're going up against, uh, oh, let's see. You're going up against uh, a, 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 your first noble is called the Lady of Worms, and she wields a longsword plus three of wounding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, God help, God help your campaign if a character gets, gets his hands on that sword. Simple. If you got if you got a half lane close real fast, grab onto her leg or something. Simple solution. <laughs> exactly. It's a long sword plus three of wounding, made by the drow. Yep. Since they seized it from the drow. Yeah, that's Enclave true. that they overran. That's true. Yeah. Now you have to worry about your underdark campaign being broken. Well, you know. But everybody down there has things like that. So that's, okay. You true true. So so what so what do you, can you do? Do you throw it in the middle of night below or something or what? Oh God. You <laughs> should not need this in your night below, no, no. but you absolutely could make it a tangential area. <laughs> That's one hell of a tangent. Especially yeah. if, you know, you get into the upper tiers and they start saying, well, I give a rat's ass about this whole slaver thing. I want something else to do. Okay. Dickens. You can go deal with this undead plague. Mm -hmm. I want to go back and play with the Aboleth, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um one of the things that you're oh my or you God. can simply say that because higher level characters are not available to assist you at this time because they're over here dealing with this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep so get that so get this get this part you there's a part where you actually talk to a drow banshee and you wow. can you can actually if you're good enough if you're good enough, you can actually recruit her and her undead beholder. <laughs> so you've got to have this suave. I see that now. <laughs> well, Aragorn managed to do it with well, the undead guys. He also, well, yeah, well, that's because he had because uh, he had King's the sword. right. It goes a long way. Yep, yep. And that sword. He had the reforged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They even have a picture of the undead. Um, of the drow banshee. <laughs> oh, it's a wow. really good picture. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's just, it's it's a just... really good picture. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sound oh. like Roseanne Barr for some reason. Sorry. It's a really good picture. Well, anyway, you know, sorry. I'm getting sick. So what can I do? Um, I love you for it. Mm -hmm. You, you fight a couple of uh, deep dragons through this, you know, I just, okay. and this is on the way to where, where the orb is. So, yeah, I mean, you. This is this is this is in the dr the dungeon, folks. This isn't a module. This is a dungeon magazine. Yes, believe it or not. Yeah, this is this is this is crazy, 
this is just crazy the way I'm I'm seeing it. Um, you 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 can actually recruit Guatoans, <laughs> Guatoans to help with the ghouls and things like that. I mean, the the possibilities are endless. I mean, just just in the fighting aspect, you're going up against Glabrezus, you know, which is like one of the toughest uh, Tanarai there are. Mm-hmm. Or de- or de- or demons anyway doesn't matter. Um, yeah. And, and y- your luck, your party will get stuck over here. The battle's over there. You got to get the battle, but you got to go through this mud sorcerer's tomb first. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But yeah, I mean, I'm just going through all this. This is crazy. This is absolutely insane. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a tough, tough, tough adventure. Well, hey, around here, tombs I... are not neutral ground. Tombs are recruiting stations. <laughs> yes. exactly. That's one thing I liked about, about Dungeon Magazine. Every once in a while, they throw you a, throw a totally insane, tough as hell adventure in there. And it's like, oh, let's see what they do with this. <laughs> That's what I liked about Dungeon. They just throw you a curveball every once in a while, like that. Yeah, I'm just. It, this is. Just, I'm. I haven't seen. I haven't seen an adventure like this. I mean, some of it, some of the printed ones that TRSR sold are not this good or this deadly. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, assault. See, mummy. see, Glenn, what we have to deal with. This is his. Yeah. Our DM's definition of good equals deadly comes out with yeah. very interesting results for the rest of us, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I think so. Okay, I, we, if, we see where you're coming I, from. We see where you're coming from. Guys, if, gotcha. I want, if I wanted to kill you, I'd have thrown you down here at third level and just let you figure it out. But I didn't do that <laughs> because I'm a nice guy. We know. <laughs> I'll let you, know, you, Gary, I'll let you... You, know, Gary, you know, Gary Gygax was a nice guy and he had two more horrors point but as as i've said previously that's because he got you know probably his players were thinking they were they were hot s and you know he just came up with that to kill them because that's all it is that's all that is it's you know to kill your kill your high level maybe maybe he gave them a lot of chances not to do that and they wouldn't listen to him so finally he had to pull out the big bat possibly possibly anyway anyway uh the two kingdom of the ghouls and what will we give this I give it about. I'll give it. I'll give it four four. stars. I'll give it four. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, this this just goes in all kinds of depth. It throws all kinds of enemies at you, but it also gives you a chance to role play and to, you know, just make things easier on yourselves. So true. What about what about you, Fog? What do you? I'll go with a five on this because this is my kind of adventure. I'll remember you said that. I'll go with a four for what it is. I don't exactly like running all these because it's just too hard on my brain to keep track of everything. I'm a simple DM. What? Well, Glenn, take you it may, in stages. You want to know take something? It in segments. You want to know something? You may have to give you. may have to give your. You may have to up your uh, up your review number there because they actually have helmed horrors in here. And that makes it better. <laughs> well, you like them. I was just saying. I'm, I'm just afraid saying. of them. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't like them. I'm afraid of them. Wow. Pick your side of the DM screen and sit on it, Glenn. Okay. Mm, got it. I'll hold it for. Wow. So what do we got? Five, four, and four. Five, yeah. four, eight, and thirteen. Four and divided four by and a third. Three. Four, and, four a third. and a third. Yep. Four and a third. Check it out. It's in dungeon number seventy. Yep. And uh, well, guys, I think we're about ready to start the start the game, and so we got to close the splat book. I hope you guys enjoyed this little uh, scur- excursion through uh, divination and all that kind of stuff with a kicker at the end there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, full on. Why don't you say goodbye? Fireball yes, does to- twelve. <laughs> yes, they roll to say goodbye. That's a gamer for you, boy. <laughs> no, I have to, that's how I say goodbye. Fireball. <laughs> Ah, it's, well, something to leave, leave something for you to think about. Okay. And Brian, what about you? You're the DM Brian. How about you? Well, I'm going to get this game started. So stay tuned, gamers. You might actually enjoy what's going on here. He means goodbye. Yeah. We and gonna, I'm we're going to have a very nice game today. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm 
<laughs> yeah, I'm glad said I'll see you next time when the hammer comes down on Thaco's hammer. Goodbye. Well, All right. right. Here's my gear. Oh, oh, here down oh, that wall. Living you wall what? Thaco's Hammer theme is provided by the Diablo Swing Orchestra. You'll find them on gemendo.com. All other additional music for this episode was provided by Kevin McLeod. You'll find more of his music on incompetech.com. Be sure to visit our website at thacoshammer.info. If you have any questions or comments, email us at thacoshammer at gmail.com. Remember, that's an O, not a zero. You can also find us on the second edition forums at osrgaming.org and at purpleworm.org. Or give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 405-806-0555. See you next time when the hammer comes down on Thaco's Hammer.